Father, in the name of Jesus, we give you praise, we give you honor, we worship you, we praise you. You are a good God. You have given us another day. You have given us another opportunity to hear your word, to share your word. King of glory, you have given us another opportunity to fellowship with you through the power of your word. Even as we share this word, I pray that it will be a blessing to all of us, that it will enlighten us, that it will empower us, that it will help us to make the right decisions and to live a better life and bear much fruit that remains in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. Today, I'm starting on a three-part message. This is part one. I'm going to be talking about the greater blessing. And I want us to begin by reading Acts chapter 20 and verse 35. I'll read from the English Standard Version, and this is what it says. It says that in all things, I have shown you that by working hard in this way, we must help the weak and remember the words of the Lord Jesus, how he himself said, it is more blessed to give than to receive. So these are the words of Apostle Paul, and he's telling the church, and he's saying, first of all, I've lived as an example, and I've shown you that in all these things, we have to work hard. And why do we have to work hard? Because we must help the weak. And he says, remember the words of the Lord Jesus. He himself, Jesus himself said, it is more blessed to give than to receive. Now, what does it mean to be blessed, first of all? We want to, first of all, understand what does it mean to be blessed. I'll teach a little more today so that we can establish this teaching before I preach so much. So, the Greek word for being blessed is the word makarios. Somebody speaks some Greek and say makarios. Makarios, just as you hear it, M-A-K-A R-I-O-S. And this word means to be fortunate or to be happy, to be favored, to be enlarged. Or it can sometimes mean length of something, something that's lengthy, okay? So sometimes when the Bible talks about a blessed life, it is a lengthy life, it is a happy life, an enlarged life, a life that is fortunate, not cursed. And in the Christian context, being blessed speaks of our inner state of well-being and uh, the prosperity of our souls in Christ. So when we talk about being blessed as Christians, we're not just talking about something on the outward, but we are talking about an inner state of our well-being and uh, our prosperity, the prosperity of our souls in Christ. And to be blessed is to experience the full impact of God's presence in our lives. So when we talk about being blessed, it's not just about eating good food. That is not the full impact of God's presence and power in our lives. When we talk about being blessed, it means we are in a position where we can experience the full effect, the full impact of God's presence and power in our lives. And in other portions of scripture, being blessed refers to a spiritual state of deep, joy-filled contentment that cannot be shaken by the conditions of this life. A deep, joy-filled contentment that cannot be shaken by poverty, that cannot be shaken by grief, that cannot be shaken by famine or persecution or war or any other trial or tragedy that we face in this life. In other words, we are in such a place whereby even when I don't have, I'm still blessed. Even when I don't see what I want to see, I'm still blessed. Why? Because it is something spiritual and is something that is deep in there and is something that has to do with contentment. I want to talk about the aspect of uh, material things when it comes to being blessed. Because sometimes when we talk about being blessed or having a blessing, uh, some people only look at the material things. Some people only look at how much money somebody has. And, you know, not everyone that has money is blessed. Not everybody that has a lot of stuff is blessed. There are so many people that are living a cursed life with a lot of material possessions. 
but they live a cursed life and they wouldn't want to stay with that life. They look at you without money, having a genuine smile, and they even wish they had your life. But when they have all these material possessions, and yes, it is true, when you are blessed, there are things that follow the blessing. So I don't want you to also think that uh, being poor is part of being blessed. That one also does not match the word, okay? But while material blessings are certainly included in God's blessing or God's favor, we realize that the Bible ascribes a much fuller meaning to the word blessed. Just like I explained to you in the beginning. When you look at the explanations and the description of what a blessing is, the definition of what a blessing is, it is much more bigger than just having material possessions. But at the same time, it is the Bible that tells us the blessing of the Lord maketh rich. Hallelujah. So we expect to have some material possessions because we are blessed. We expect to be rich because of the blessing of the Lord upon our lives. But at the same time, you have to also know that those material blessings do not entirely explain the blessing of the Lord. You having some kamani does not entirely mean that now you are blessed. The blessing of the Lord maketh rich. But it does not mean that having material blessings is the entirety of the explanation of the blessing of the Lord or is the explanation of being blessed. Hallelujah. In the words of Jesus that Paul refers to in the verse that we just read in Acts chapter 20 and verse 35, a comparative word is used. He uses a word that is to do with comparison. He said, more blessed than. Okay? More blessed than. That, that is a comparative word. And that means that even when you receive, you are blessed. Not so. If I say uh, this one is bigger than this, it does not mean that the, this one is necessarily small. It may be big, but the other one is bigger. You understand that? So he's using a comparative word, and he's not saying that if you receive, you are cursed. No. He says there is a blessing in receiving. But then he says there is, there is a more blessing. There is a bigger blessing. There is a greater blessing in giving. Hallelujah. And that's why the title of my message is talking about the greater blessing. So he says here, more blessed than. That means that when you receive, you are blessed. In other words, when you receive, like we talked about the meaning of the word makarios, you are happy. You, 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 you feel some contentment. You feel good about it. But when you give, you receive more contentment. You have more joy. You have more favor. You are in a better place because you are dealing with the greater blessing. Tell your neighbor, neighbor. It is a good thing to receive, but it's a better thing to give. There is a blessing in receiving. When you receive, you feel blessed. But the one who has given you is much more blessed, even when they don't feel it. And we all have to live in this greater blessing. If we want to experience God's blessing in a better, bigger way, we should always choose to be more on the giving side than the receiving side. Some of us, the way we are conditioned in our mindset, you always want to be on the receiving end. You always want to be the one getting. Even in your prayers, you want to be the one to get. You want to be the one to receive. And this is how so many Africans have been framed in their mindset. And that's one of the reasons as to why, when you look at the expression of being blessed in terms of physical things, physical possessions, America, Europe, they seem to be more blessed when you are to talk about the blessing in the aspect of physical possessions. More than us in Africa. Do you know why? Because in these other parts, the majority of the people want to be on the receiving end than the giving end. And the other people think more in terms of giving. So they automatically, when it comes to physical possessions, which to some extent, represent the blessing. 
Some of them are not even Christians. Most of them are not even Christians. Most of them don't even want to hear about God. But you know, this is one of those universal principles that the giver is always in a better place than the receiver. And if we want to change Africa, this mentality has to change. If you want to change your life, this mentality has to change. You have to look at yourself as the one that always has to operate in the greater blessing, not the lesser. You are always operating in the lesser blessing if you are always on the receiving end. The people that are always giving to you are the ones that receive the greater blessing. Even when they don't pray for it, every time they give you, God bless you. God bless you. For them, they keep receiving the blessing. They receive the greater blessing all the time. So many of those of that don't even know how to pray. What do they do? They come here and they give clothes. They give money. They, they, they build hospitals. They build schools. They are giving. And we are always smiling. Hey, 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 hey. Muzum, may God bless you. May God bless you. May God bless you. And they go back and they are always more blessed. Because we are always here every day praying. A visitor comes and they are like, hey, you guys have a nice place. How did you get it? Ah, you know, some guy came and just blessed us. He did what? He blessed us. By you receiving, you feel and you know you got a blessing. But then, this person also declares, eh, may God bless them. They receive another blessing. Why? Because there's always more blessed to give than to receive. Hallelujah. And you have to start thinking this way if you want to operate in the greater blessing. In your prayers, don't keep praying of God, send me someone that will give me. Send me people that will give me. Lord, I pray somebody will give me. Some of us only make those prayers. You are always looking for how you will get. And you always operate in the lesser realm when it comes to the blessing of the Lord. But if you want to operate in the greater realm, you need to start making prayers like, God, grant me the ability to give. Bless me with a Lord that I may be able to feed the poor. Bless me a Lord that I may be able to help a whole village. That should be your kind of prayer line if you want to operate in the greater blessing of God. Hallelujah. In this very verse still, we are encouraged to work hard. And he includes the purpose for greater work, for this hard work. What does Paul say? He tells us that we need to work hard that we may be able to help those who are weak, to help those who are less privileged, to help those who do not have what we have. So he is even telling us that the essence of our hard work should be for the purpose of being a greater blessing. The purpose of our hard work should be that we may give. Help me tell your neighbor, neighbor. I pray for you that God will give you the grace to work hard, to work smart, that you may get a lot of money so that you may help those who do not have that much money. That should be the purpose for your hard work, child of God. Hallelujah. Don't only think of working so hard so that you can get yourself a big car, so that you can get yourself a bigger house, so that you can uh, dress like that person that you watched in a certain movie. That, that, should not, your, that should not be the only reason as to why you want to work hard. The reason you should work hard, according to Paul here, is so that you can have the ability to help the weak. Not just the weak, who cannot have enough strength in them, but here he's talking in terms of material possessions, in terms of having. He's talking about the weak financially, the weak in terms of how they can feed themselves so that we can be able to help those who do not have what we have. That is the reason for our hard work, so that we can be better givers. The reason you need to work more to get more is so that you can be a better giver. And that is the way you experience God's greater blessing. We experience a greater happiness and contentment from our hard work when it is not all about lavishing everything on ourselves, but when it involves helping the poor, giving to the needy, supporting those that do not have as much as 
they would need to even sustain their lives. And this is what we have trained the people in our ministry to do. You know, when we go out for the missions, people there feel we have a lot of money. They think we have a lot of money. But we don't have a lot of money. Yeah, the Lord has blessed us with some money. But do you know why we do the things we do? Because of these two things. Number one, because of faith. And number two, because we have a changed mindset. We have tuned ourselves to believing and understanding that we must be on the giving side, not always on the receiving side. And when we are going for missions, what do we do? We tell everybody, students at the university, these young people that have just begun working, some of them with a salary of half a million or less, some of them with a little more than that, and they haven't even established themselves. They, they don't even have lands and cars and houses. Some of them have, but most of them don't. Some of them are in, even in first year, just at campus. And we institute this principle in their mindset that this is what you have to do. Off your upkeep, give for the mission. Because when we talk about the poor, we are not just talking about the poor physically. There are those who are poor spiritually, who need to hear the gospel. Those are poor. They need to hear the good news. Some of them have some money, but they are poor spiritually. They are going to hell. And others have Jesus, but they are poor physically. And the worst scenario are those who are poor physically and they don't even have Christ. Tell your neighbor, neighbor. Imagine being poor. And at the same time, you are not saved. That is double poverty. So we need to work hard to help those poor. Preach the gospel to them. At the same time, build some houses for them. Give them some food to eat. Take them to school. That is the reason as we have to work hard so that we can be a blessing to those that do not have as much as we have. And by doing so, we are positioning ourselves for the greater blessing. So when we go out there, like when we went to Mayuge, I think that was 2017, 18. We, construct, we, ha we were having a Christmas mission, and in our Christmas missions, we, we feed the entire village. Not because we have a lot, but because we know that we are supposed to be the givers. So we slaughtered the cow and fed the village and people began to get scared of us. They said, these, these young people have money. No, we just have a changed mindset and we have faith. Those two things can make your entire life change in Jesus' name. We know we are supposed to be the blessing to others. Not always to wait for give me, give me. As people are saying, where is my Christmas? For us, we are giving people their Christmas in Jesus' name. Tell your neighbor this Christmas, you won't ask for people where your Christmas is. As if it is your birthday, as if you are Jesus. You'll be the one giving people their Christmas in Jesus' name. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. As people ask me, where is my Christmas? We are telling an entire community that we have your Christmas meal in Jesus' name. Amen. Because it is more blessed to do that than to keep calling people, asking them for where is my Christmas. And then God put it upon our hearts to even do a special project. And we constructed for this widow a house. She was a widow taking care of these eight youngsters, and she didn't have much, and they were sleeping in this funny mud house that didn't even have a stable roof. I mean, they would just put iron sheets, and then they were not nailed. I don't know if you've ever seen such a house. They would put some bars and then place them on, and then place some things to hold the iron sheets. And she told us sometimes the rain would come when it is windy, and in the night it just takes the iron sheets off, and they replace them the following day. And we said, this is why we work hard. This is the reason as to why we get the money we get. Our salaries, our upkeep, that we may help the poor. That we may help those who do not have. And when we constructed that house, people didn't even know we were doing it by faith. You know, we wanted to finish that house in seven days. And it was 90% completed in seven days. We wanted to get out of that mission when it is done. And when people looked at the speed at which we were working, Sometimes constructing in the night or with a floodlight so that we can finish the project. People say, these young people have money. It seems they have sponsors. You know, that's the African mentality. Because they believe you must have gotten from somebody. You are there to receive. They didn't know we are, we are changed by the scriptures. For us, we are there to give. Hallelujah. I want to raise a generation of young people here in Africa 
that believe they are there to give in Jesus' name. Those that choose to operate in the greater blessing. Those that want to be more blessed than those who are waiting to receive. And when we constructed that house, people began saying, Eh, hey, Banangi, I'm also a widow. There is even another widow we know over there. They thought we were there to construct houses for every other widow. No, we were just operating in our faith with the little that we had. But at least we were there to give, and that's what we do. That's how we live. We live in the greater blessing, not by just declaring, greater blessing, come to me. No, but by living out the principle of the scripture in Jesus' name. They didn't even know we were doing it by faith. Bags of cement were disappearing like no man's business. Ah. But the site was busy because we had a changed attitude. But we also had faith. As they are finishing the last bag of cement, the miracle comes in. And then you call and you're like, I'll buy another five. Huh? And they say, Bane, these young people have money. No, it had just arrived at that very minute. Praise the Lord. But the whole thing here is, at least we set out to do what the scriptures say. To make sure that we are more blessed by giving than waiting to receive. Even when we went to Uyende in 2018, I think, constructed this church for some brethren we found there. It's not a branch uh, of CTC. And, and people saw us construct this church so fast. And they're like, even some pastors came and they're like, even ours needs help. Still, they thought like the other people that probably we, we have some project to do this. No, we were just acting out our faith. And this is what we do, children of God. This is how we have trained the transformers. This is how you should train your children. That you are not here to be a receiver. You are here to be a giver. Because you have to operate in the greater blessing in this life in Jesus' name. Luke chapter 6 and verse 38. Luke chapter 6 and verse 38. He says, give and it will be given to you. A good measure, pressed down, shaken together, and running over, will be poured out into your lap. For with the measure you use, it will be measured to you. Hallelujah. So here the Bible tells us that according to God's principle, when you give, you always get much more in return than what you have given. And that is why when you give, you are more blessed. According to the principle in Luke 638, when you give, you get much more than what you gave. You give, but when you give it, they have to press it down, shake it together, and make sure that by the time it comes back to you, it is in overflow mode. Hallelujah. I want to declare for those of you that have given unto the work of the Lord, those of you that have been generous with your tithes, those of you that have been generous with your seeds and you have sowed in the work of the Lord. Those of you that are generous in the house of the Lord with your offerings. Those of you that have been generous in helping out people, in feeding people, in taking people to school. I want to tell you, your blessing is always going to be greater than what you have given in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. And some of you have to be expectant for something greater coming your way in the name of the Lord. Amen. Because it is more blessed to give than to receive. Hallelujah. And when you are a giver, you attract givers to you. It is another thing that we see in Luke 6, 38. He says that give and it will be given to you. What does he say? He says a good measure pressed down eh, will be poured into your lap. Another version says men will pour it back into your bosom or into your lap. So in other words, when you give, he's not saying it's going to fall from heaven. He says people are going to come and they will give it back to you. But they're not going to give back to you what you gave. And this is the principle many people don't understand. When you give, you are actually multiplying what you have. When you eat what you have, it cannot multiply. But when you give what you have, it is multiplying. They bring it back to you in greater quantity. God will make sure that when you give, your giving attracts men to bring it back to you. It will attract some women to bring it back to you, shaken together, running over, pressed down. It will come back to you. How does it come back to you? By attracting some givers to your end. Hallelujah. 
So when you are a giver, you attract givers to you. The word of God confirms it in Proverbs 11.25 when it says that, I will read the amplified version here, that the generous man is a source of blessing and shall be prosperous and enriched. And he who waters, he himself will be watered, reaping generosity that he has sown. Hallelujah. I love the way the Amplified Version puts it. So it says that when you water others, when you refresh others, when you take care of others, you yourself, you attract people that will refresh you. You attract people that will be interested in watering you. You attract people that will be interested in being generous to you as you reap the generosity that you have sown. Some of us, we have no harvest to expect. Or we have very little harvest to expect because you have sowed very little generosity. You have watered nobody, so you are attracting nobody to water you. You refresh nobody through your giving, so you are attracting nobody to refresh you. But for some of us, it is our daily life. People are always there to bless us. Hallelujah. Because we are blessing to others. Praise be to God. Even as I preach this message, someone might just send some mobile money to me. Because that, that is my life. Praise the Lord. People just keep asking me, please confirm your MTN number again. And I'm not so surprised because this is what he, he, Proverbs 11.25 says. When you water others, when you refresh others, you, you yourself are going to always be refreshed by others. You, when you sow generosity, you attract generosity. And that is the greater blessing. Hallelujah. Amen. Psalms 112 and verse 5. He says, good will come to those who are generous and lend freely, who conduct their affairs with justice. What does he say? Good will come to those who are generous. Whenever you are a giver, whenever you are generous, you always attract good to come to you. And this is a universal principle I'm telling you. Some of us just want to hear people's testimonies and we claim them. You hear them say, the other day somebody blessed me with 100,000 and then the next day you people have enjoyed this week, somebody just called me and said, uh, this money that you had to pay, don't pay it. And another person told me, they are attracting good things, but those things don't just happen. Especially when it is a lifestyle. Of course, some people get a miracle once in a while, even when they're stingy people. But I'm talking about people who live a lifestyle of receiving generosity from other people. It is created through them sowing generosity. It is created through them being a blessing in their giving, and they always attract givers towards them. One time I was there and somebody said, I have your envelope. One of my students in the discipleship course. And I said, okay. You know, when people say they have my envelope, I think they're going to give towards the ministry. I think they're giving an offering or they want to fulfill a pledge or something that they made towards the ministry. I, I really think they want to give me money because that's not what I, I, I am for here. I'm here to give. That is my motive. But you cannot reverse the principle. The principle says if you're here to give, somehow you're always there to receive. Hallelujah. There was 100,000 in that envelope, and there was a note, and this person was telling me, thank you for always investing your time to teach us these things. I'm like, glory to God. When you are a blessing, people just feel convicted to be a blessing to you. But Psalms 112 verse 5 here tells us that God will come to those who are generous and lend freely. It tells you, you move from a point of being the one to look for the good, but the good is attracted to you. Generosity attracts goodness. When you are freely giving out to people, of course not in a, an uncalculated way. I'm not saying you go to the street and just begin to give out your money and you're saying, but for me, say, Zengi. now we quiet, now we quiet, now we quiet. It's not what I'm saying. Of course you give, but you have to be led by the Holy Spirit. If you give stupidly, without any wisdom applied, you'll end up in poverty. Okay? So I'm not saying you, you just say, eh, but some says, oh, who are you? I don't want any man on me. I'm just giving it to anybody anyway. Yeah. No, that's not what it means. But it means you have a generous free heart when it comes to giving. Hallelujah. And when you are in that position, 
you cease to chase money and money begins to get attracted to you. Did you read the scripture well? It says good will do what? Will come. It is not the person that is generous that goes to look for the good. When you are generous, when you are someone that even lends freely to people without taking them to, to prison and without making them sign a hundred documents just for lending them 5,000 shillings, it means you lend to them with a free heart and you are generous to people. He says, good will come to you. In other words, generosity attracts goodness. You stop chasing the good stuff, but the good stuff begins coming to you. I want you to live in that realm of greater blessings, whereby you do not chase money anymore, but money looks for you in Jesus' name. Amen. Whereby you do not look for a blessing, but the blessings look for you. Hallelujah. I want you to choose the greater blessing. Don't keep yourself on the receiving end only. Choose to be a generous giver. And how do you learn to be a generous giver? Firstly, toward God, and then towards other people. Don't begin by being generous to people only. That is a wrong equation. You begin by being generous to God because that's an element of worship. And this God that you are generous to will make sure that his principle comes to pass in your life. So you give to God first. You choose to be a generous giver to God. You, you are a free giver. When they talk about giving to God, the calculations are less. But some of you, even the way you give to God, even the tithe, you don't really give it freely. You give it by law. You're like, why? There is nothing I can do. There is nothing I can do. You're not a free giver. It's like you are, you are giving out of compulsion. You're like, singa kali singa And for the offering, you say, after all, you didn't measure the offering. Today it is only the tithe. Hey, the offering, you said it is a free will offering. Sina musango. So today I'm not giving an offering, but your tithe I will give you. But the way you are giving, is you're not a free giver. It's like God is, God is taking away from you. Like God is robbing you. That's how your mentality is. But free givers don't have to first get the calculator to the last cent. Some of you, when you get 13,500, you're like, huh, I don't want God to rob me. They said you take off the, first, the last zero. Uh, so my tithe is that. Uh, it was 1350. Yeah, 1350. And the economy is tight. No offering. No offering. So, where do I get the 50 shillings? I need change. You get the 100 coin and you tell the shopkeeper, do you still have 50, 50 shilling notes, please? I want a 50 shilling note. And they tell you, who is going to use it? Are you, you give me, don't worry. I'll give it to him. I'll give him his tithe. Hmm. And you make sure it is 1,350. Even when the 50 is no longer operation anywhere. I mean, you find those offerings in church and you're like, why did somebody have to bring a 50 shilling? You, you can't even make it 1,500 and count it as your tithe. You're like, ah. Hmm, don't mess things up. They say it is 10%. They say it is 10%. If you are living in that kind of life, even toward God, you are living a very miserable life. You will never understand how people enjoy the free blessing of God because you are not a free giver. You give, but you are not generous at heart. You give, but you give because it is a law. You give because the pastor has talked about it a lot. And because everyone has asked for an envelope, and you're like, oh, why? Will they think I'm the one who has not asked for an envelope? And then you look for the least amount in your pocket. 20, 10. No, no, no. I had a 1K. I had a 1K somewhere. Yeah. Oh. For you, the definition of offering is 1,000. And on a day you feel so happy, it is 1,200. That's your definition of giving to God. Let me tell you something. You are missing out on the greater blessing. Because you have not yet identified this truth. That for you to give, it puts you in a better position. It makes you happier. 
It gives you greater contentment. It puts you in a position whereby you are going to receive much more than whatever you will ever give. I want you to practice living in the greater blessing. Choose to be a giver. Even from the little you have, keep giving. Some of us don't know how to amass money. That time will come when millions can just pile up on the account in a very short while. But right now, the millions come and they just go out because we are programmed to give. When the millions come, you have somebody to take care of. You have church ministry to take care of. You need to be a blessing to the house of the Lord. And that is our life. Hallelujah. May that be your life in Jesus' name. Amen. And I want to still proclaim to you that has chosen generosity. I want you to always keep an expectation of greater blessings coming your way in Jesus' name. Amen. Your giving is not in vain. Say in the name of Jesus. I choose to live in the realm of greater blessings. I choose to be a generous giver. I choose to be a free giver. I cast out stinginess out of my system. I cast out selfishness out of my system. I receive the revelation of God. And I know that generosity attracts goodness to me. And as I give to God, as I give to other people, I know I'm going to receive much more than what I have given. And I am attracting givers to me. I'm attracting greater blessings to me. In the mighty name of Jesus, I choose to be a great giver. In the name of the Lord, Declare it in your own words. May God increase grace upon you to receive this word. The mind of generosity, the mind of a giver, the mind of a blesser, not just a receiver. May God help your mind to be tuned to giving and to generosity all the days of your life. May you, may you be stirred up to be generous towards God. May you be stirred up to be rich toward God. May you be stirred up to be a blessing to the people in your clan, to be a blessing to the people around you, to be a blessing to the poor, to be a blessing to the weak and the needy, to be a blessing to those who have not had the gospel. And as you do so, may God show you his blessing. May God put Pour out his blessing upon you that maketh rich and bringeth no sorrow in the mighty name of Jesus. Hallelujah. Glory to God in Jesus' mighty name. And somebody said, Amen and Amen. Hallelujah. Give the Lord a mighty hand of praise.